It's great to be back. Um, I just wanted to give you some experience that I've had over the last 20 years. I started putting artificial disc in in 2001. Actually, I put the second lumbar artificial disc in the country, and I put the first protest C in the country. So these are the artificial discs that I have experience with. It's not to, you know, some, there's probably some vendors artificial disc is not here. I don't want to, it, it wasn't by any intention. I just don't have experience with it. And I just wanted to say that not all artificial discs are the same. And each one has its unique characteristics. The one on the left at zero is the PCM device. And what's fascinating is it's probably the easiest to put in, but probably the least stable because this does have a propensity to kind of, you know, I would say subluxate. And we don't see this on the market anymore. The next is the Moby C. It's a dome shape. It, you know, it's, it's good because it has a size five. It's probably the easiest one to put in right now. Okay, I think the Moby C is the most straightforward. However, I do think it's probably the most mobile. And because of that, sometimes it's challenging. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. It's easy to put in, but because of that, sometimes it's a little unpredictable because of its kind of mobility. Um, the next one is a Simplify. This was just finished in clinical trials. It's a little bit more stable. It's unique because it's a peak on peak bearing um, and has a ceramic core and it's extremely MR compatible. It actually is pretty straightforward and pretty simple to put in. It has a slight keel, but it's not that bad. Uh, and um, the advantage is it actually has a four. So it has a four height. And I think for all of us who've placed artificial disc in, you know, it's always a struggle to even put a five in. So it does have a four. Um, the next is the LP Prestige. Um, I think it's a little bit more difficult to put in in scale. Uh, you got you do have to work at the keels a little bit. Um, it has an anterior buttress and it's good and bad because, you know, if you have a really deep artificial disc, this, you really can't get it back because it's really buttresses on the anterior side. Um, the, the center of rotation is a little bit posterior. It makes it kind of interesting. I always feel like these tend to be a little bit more flat you know, maybe a little bit more, I don't want to say kyphotic because it sounds bad, but I don't see when I put this in that I can really get a lot of lower doses out of it. They just really tend to be more neutral or forward. Um, Protus C, it's, it's a good standard. I think one of the, one of the great things about Protus C is it, it's a little bit more challenging because of the keel. You have to cut the keel or mill the keel. For multi-levels, it can be challenging because people feel like, okay, maybe I'm going to split the, inter um, the intervening vertebral body, but it is incredibly stable. And because of that, you know, I've really progressed over time using more stable implants. Um, it has a five, but it, it's a little bit more challenging because of the keel and it's not MR compatible. Okay. Finally, on the last is the Orthofix M6. It was recently released probably last year, maybe a year and a half ago. It is a compliant disc. So finally, we have a disc that kind of mimics the nucleus in some sense. Whether that matters or not, I'm not really sure. I would say in general, all the artificial discs work pretty well. Okay, so I don't think there's one that, you know, is, is spectacular. They all work pretty well. However, the M6 probably is the most stable. And I think because of that, as we start seeing expanded indications, treating spondylosis, you know, hybrid constructs, I'm favoring more stable artificial disc. Okay, now you don't really need it for the standard, you know, soft disc herniation single level, but when you start expanding your indications and you get bored of doing the same thing over and over again, I, I kind of like the stability. Now it's a little bit more challenging because it is a six millimeter, that's, a mil that's the minimum height. So, you know, you have to do some end plate work. Um, and however, it is MR compatible. And I think that that's really nice. And especially when you start treating spondylosis, I think MR compatibility is, is critical. Okay. So some of the unique things that I've seen, um, we always look at data. We want tenure data and so on and so forth. But, you know, this paper is unique because this is Sasso's data. He followed up his patients, his own site for 10 years. And it's amazing the differential, you know, it was a six-fold difference in the amount of fusions that he had to do in the adjacent level in the group that were fused. In the artificial disc group, only one in the, um, in the fusion group, six came back. And they were about equal, 22 and 25 patients in each group. I think that's pretty interesting. And, you know, this is my site. So I was, I participated in the MOBC trial. I brought my patients back at 10 years, which was incredible. It's incredible to see these patients at 10 years. Um, I had 26 patients, sorry, I had 28 patients in the MOBC group. I brought back 26, so a follow-up rate of 93%. 
I couldn't even get the fusion patients back. I tried. They wouldn't come back. You know, they thought they got the booby prize. So they're like, no, we're not coming back. The Moby C guys were really happy because they got the new technology. They would come back. But out of all of those 26 patients, not one had adjacent level surgery, not by myself or by anyone else. And um, what's amazing, if you just look at these x-rays, and I show this to you, I know you guys have seen this before, but it's, it's pretty incredible because you never see this. You never see 10-year follow-up. And so I'm going to show this to you. This is three months and 10 years. And for those of you that have seen this, I'm going to bore you again. But look at the adjacent level at 10 years. Look at that. It's just, when I saw this, when these patients came back, I was kind of, it was amazing to me. Look at the adjacent level. Very preserved. Another case. And all these cases are very similar. It's not like I picked the best case. Another two level, look at the adjacent level at 10 years. Another one, look at the adjacent level at 10 years. Even though maybe I could have done a little bit better with the MOBC and the placement, it looks kind of weird. And honestly, some of these do look a little weird, but the patients do quite well. I think a lot of you probably have had that experience, but look at the adjacent level. It's pretty amazing. Now, this is one that actually came to me as one of my fusion patients at 10 years. And he came back because he got an artificial disc at the adjacent level. He got a hybrid construct. But at 10 years, this is what he looks like. And he was in the MOBC trial as well. So, I mean, yes, I think the data shows this now, but I think these x-rays really prove to me that, you know, it, it's something that really makes sense. You know, it's like, I don't know why we were so baffled by it for such a long time. It's something that totally makes sense. If you preserve motion, you probably decrease the incidence of adjacent level degeneration. If you fuse the disc, there probably, guess what, is load placed at the adjacent level, which causes more degeneration. It's amazing. Okay. So um, these days, I really hate a four-level fusion. I don't even do it anymore. I, I, if I have to do it, and I feel like I have to do it from the front, I'll send it to my partner. I think it's just the most difficult operation not really because we can't do it. We have the technology to do it. We've got a great plate. You can get a great exposure. It's just like Dan is saying, a four-level fusion rarely fuses unless you use BMP, okay? I think a three-level fusion, if you don't, you know, if you don't use BMP, you're probably looking at a pseudo rate, an honest pseudo rate of 50%. Now, it may not be symptomatic, but these things are very, very difficult to fuse. Now, I think Dan uses BMP to get it to fuse. I use an artificial disc, okay? That's my kind of pseudoarthrosis avoidance, okay? So in patients like this, I am always looking to decrease my fusion burden. I wanna change my fusion burden to the mechanical burden. And I think the mechanics of the artificial disc have been, you know, they've been proven. They're, they're working long-term. So cases like this, I definitely don't wanna do this because I did do this. And then I said to myself, I don't want to use BMP. I'm going to get a pseudoarthrosis. So then I justified this. But even when I did this, I said, hey, the patients do great. And I'm not saying the patients actually do pretty well. But if I really think about it, I certainly think that in modern spine surgery, we certainly have something better for the patient that's more functional. And that's the hybrid option. And, you know, whether the artificial disc moves or not, you've definitely decreased the pseudoarthrosis rate, right? And you don't need to go posterior. So I think that's a benefit. Okay, so now this is like, if you wanna start doing kind of hybrid procedures or spondylosis, this is the problem, is how do you address the collapsed disc, okay? Because the end plate is everything. So this is kind of what happens, you know, if you cannot address the collapsed disc, if you take the end plate and you're doing multi-level, slowly you'll get cases where the vertebral body will subside and the patient will come back with more pain. You know, here's another case. This is uh, July of 2020, you know, and now this is a month later, okay? So you really have to preserve the end plate. That is critical. And the way you do that is you really have to do a complete release, okay? So just like Dan said in his osteotomies, you know, you can do a beautiful soft tissue release and it's really similar. You have to go wide, you have to go outside the vertebral joint sometimes, but if you do that, if he can do an osteotomy anteriorly with a fused patient, we can certainly distract the disc space with a non-fused patient. You just have to go wide and be careful. So the way I do this, you put distraction pins and then you use a cob, okay? And you slowly distract and you use the distraction pins as external fixators. So you never distract with the pins. You just hold your interdiscal distraction, 
okay? And you slowly do this step by step. You use interdistal extractors, you go wide. And typically, once you do this, you can get disk space distraction without taking the end plate. And this is how you, I think, really can do multi-levels and treat spondylosis, do those complex hybrid cases. But you got to understand this technique, and that's the most important. And if you do this, if you understand this, then you can do multi-levels. If you look at the intervertebral and vertebral bodies, you know, you'll see that there's not much bone taken. Another case, this is actually the simplified disc. Okay, so you can do spondylosis. Like I would never fuse this patient at three levels because I would think I'm gonna have to come back for the fourth level very soon. So I'm always trying to avoid multi-level fusions, always. And this is one way, this is a three-level artificial disc. But again, if you understand it, you can really preserve the end plate and put artificial disc in, restore similar doses and function without you know, kind of destroying the end plate. And that's what you have to do. This is, uh, I guess this is a prestige LP, very similar, you know, three level kind of spondylosis, you know, a little bit of radiculopathy, maybe some myelopathy, but certainly nothing that I want to do a three level fusion for, you know, and I think this is just a better outcome. And this patient doesn't have to go into collar because I'm not worried about a superarthrosis. Okay. So kind of, you know, complication avoidance. I see this a lot. I see this a lot with my fellows actually, because every so often the fellow finishes, they go out and about six months later, they call me and they send an x-ray and going like, Hey, I put an OBC in, look at this. What did I do wrong? Do I need to take this out? Usually these cases that I've seen, they're relatively asymptomatic. It's kind of the hockey puck cord that's kind of posterior. And in analyzing these cases, because I've seen these cases, I don't know, I've probably seen 50 of these cases. I do think it's really due to the dome and the posterior end plate, kind of that posterior resection. So you have to be pretty careful. And I think what happens is, is that people try to preserve the dome, okay? And so they don't wanna take the anterior lip because it is a dome-shaped prosthesis. So they kind of tilt the microscope up to avoid the anterior lip because they're trying to preserve the dome and they do this posterior resection and then the next thing you know, they put a MOBC in and at the core kind of dislocates posteriorly. Now, what's amazing is, is a lot of people will say that is in kyphosis. Well, the functional unit of the spine is not in kyphosis. It's actually neutral. The prosthesis is in kyphosis, okay? And kind of locked in this position. So um, just for revision sake, this is a case, this is a 50 year old Jermel. This is actually one of my med school roommates. He had a, a C5 radiculopathy, and anyway, um, he had a MOBC placed, okay? This was his index operation, has a MOBC placed, and it looks like this, okay? Now, when I see it, I'm like, you know, I wouldn't say it's the optimal placement. He did get relief of his radiculopathy, but what's amazing is if you look at this MOBC in this position and you look at the spinous processes, it's really not moving. So again, it's kind of locked. That core is not functioning. This is really, really locked. And um, what you see later on is, is that not only do, do, does he develop reoccurring pain in the C5 distribution, but later on he gets a C6 radiculopathy as well with little biceps weakness. And so the question is, you know, what do you do here? You know, I mean, you've got now a C4, 5 level that probably is symptomatic for him. He's got another disc herniation, framal stenosis, C5, 6. And so, you know, the question is, you know, you know, these are your options, right? Um, you can do a revision fusion, you can do a hybrid, um, you can try to revise the artificial disc, uh, you can do a posterior cervical foranotomy. But I will say that I've had a lot of luck of revising artificial disc to artificial disc if the end plate is preserved. Now, those cases I showed you with end plate collapse, those are all vertebrectomies. You know, those have all been converted to vertebrectomies. But if the end plate is preserved like this case, you know, you can place and revise the artificial disc. I actually like the kind of flat on flat artificial disc because I like to place my disc now. So I want to kind of, I'm not a fan of the dome as much because I think the dome is a little unreliable. I actually like to, you know, cut the end plate and make sure that it's perfectly flat and that I can actually place the disc where I want. And so this is one where the end plate is preserved. So I use, like to use a very stable implant if I'm going to revise an artificial disc. So I'll either use a Prodis C or now an M6. So I think it's MR compatible and I do think it's quite stable. So this is kind of the revision, but that's why I kind of like the more stable artificial disc. 
So hybrid cases. So again, it's not, you know, in a case like this, you know, my ideal here is, okay, I'm going to do a four level artificial disc. I'm really not trying to avoid that. What I'm trying to do is, is that I don't want to do a three level fusion. My pseudoarthrosis rate goes up. I think the more you fuse, the functional outcome of the patient decreases. I really just don't want to do a three level fusion. So this is a two level fusion for me. For Dan, he wouldn't put him in a collar. I don't put this patient in the collar, you know, so and I think this functionally performs better. And you can see that he has motion at the adjacent level. A 68 year old with myelopathy, okay? You can see that it has this posterior soft disc. It's not OPLL, but it's a soft disc. And you know, what do you do here? Anybody wanna do an artificial disc? Any takers? Tom? No? Anybody in the West Coast? Cause we're bold. <laughs> Jeff? No, okay. So anyway, this patient, um, uh, let's see what I did. Yeah, this patient gets a cord back to me. <laughs> right? But the patient comes back a year later, or two years later, you know, and now he's got changes below. And so now what do you do? Right? So, so again, I don't want to do a four level fusion. I've already fused two levels. I don't want to do another two level fusion. And it's the same thing. I don't want to put this patient in a collar. I really want to preserve some function. I don't want to take the plate out because I want to make it easier for myself. And I'm not a fan of standalones. You know, I, I really don't think they've fused that well, but uh, if you're gonna use a standalone, I do like the Synthes one that has like a plate and four screws. It's a pain to put in, but I do feel like you have the best chance. And then, you know, place an artificial disc below, another hybrid construct from below, okay? So, you know, it's something that I'm not worried about a pseudoarthrosis. I only really fused one more level. I gave him some, you know, function. You know, I, I like this procedure quite a bit. Okay, so basically fundamental rules of the ADR, it's decompression, decompression. You gotta take the care of the neurologic issue, right? Three That's minutes it. over. Over? Yeah, okay. three minutes over. Oh, three minutes? Just wrap up. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's really it. And preserve the end plate, right? Just preserve <laughs> the end plate. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>